Hello everyone, uh, this is the first video for the first chapter. Uh, this video is not intended to replace your reading. Uh, I will cover key concepts, but they'll be covered in more detail and in some content concepts I don't include in the videos because I want to keep the videos relatively short. Uh, so the best thing to do would be to read the chapter, and then uh, if you are a little unclear on something, then watch a video. Or I suppose alternatively, you could watch a video first and then read. But I would re you you must read in order to get exposed to all the information that you're going to need uh, to be successful. All right. So having said that, let's move on. Uh, one of the key goals for this entire course, something that I hope you can do by the end of the semester, is to create a well-supported scientific conclusion. Uh, this graphic on the screen may help explain what I'm talking about. On the very top, you can see that we have a scientific conclusion, and what's holding it up is statistical evidence and a scientific context. The statistical evidence uh, that comes in many forms, right? And in this class, we're going to talk about three different types of statistical evidence. Hypothesis testing with a continuous p-value, the practical importance of results with an effect size, and then population estimation with confidence intervals. These three different types of statistical evidence have their own strengths and weaknesses. And in order to use statistical evidence well, you really need to have all three of these things. Uh, they collectively will support a scientific conclusion. If you remove any one of those, your scientific conclusion is going to be missing some support that's needed. The fourth pillar is really non-statistical in nature. It's in telling you that you really should think about what your numbers mean. You need to think about how the statistical evidence was generated. If the methodology that generated the statistical results was poor, uh, it had a methodological flaw in some way, then that evidence is going to be less compelling than if the methodology is strong. So you can't just look at the numbers, just look at the statistics. All statistics are generated through some kind of data collection process. And if that process has flaws, then the statistical evidence is going to be less compelling. It's going to be, and if, if they're serious enough, the statistical evidence should be thrown out. It doesn't mean that a study has to be perfect to be useful, but the more flaws that it has, the less compelling the evidence it will provide. As we get further into the course, we'll also talk a little bit about the scientific literature, and we'll compare the results that you generate with the results that other researchers have generated. This is really important because if your results are similar to those that other researchers have found, you should have even greater confidence in your results because you've replicated someone else's work. You've, you've found similar findings. If uh, two independent researchers come to the same conclusion, obviously that means that you should have even stronger support for that conclusion. Now, if you come up with contradictory results, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong. Uh, what you should do is you should compare their methodology and your methodology. Maybe there's an explanation for why the two studies have conflicting results. If you can identify what that explanation is, that's great. You've learned something. You've identified a new factor that influences the results. And that's what science is all about. So, Lots of times, some of the most important findings are found uh, when results are contradictory to what others found. 
Again, this is what we're going to be wanting you to do at the end of the course. Use statistical evidence and think about what it means, consider methodology in previous literature, and weave that all together to support a sound scientific conclusion. A major part of this first introductory chapter is introducing terms. Uh, while terms are not always that exciting, uh, they are important. We're going to be using these terms for the rest of the semester, and so it is important that you are able to uh, seamlessly use these terms and that you are able to see the relationships among these terms. So I'm going to use an example uh, that hopefully will illustrate how all of these terms are related to each other. Let's suppose that I am a scientist who's interested in studying uh, the population of college students. Now, the population of college students is way too big for me to study. There's, uh, in the world, of course, there will be millions and millions of uh, college students, and there's no possible way I could study all of them. So instead, what I have to do is I have to take a sample of that population. Now, the goal of taking a sample is to represent the population from which it was taken. Uh, ideally, the results I get from the sample would be very similar to the results I would get from the population. When we did get a result from a sample, that is called a sample statistic. So results, values, results that come from a sample are, are called statistics. Values that come from parameter, or excuse me, values that come from populations are called parameters. Uh, it's, so we use sample statistics to estimate population parameters. As researchers, we really want to study population parameters. We want to study populations. We want to know what the result is in the entire population, called the parameter. But we can't because it's too big. So we take a sample and we infer that the results from the sample are very similar to what we would get if we were able to study the entire population. So we use sample statistics to estimate population parameters. And when we do that, that's called inferential statistics. Again, because we're inferring that the sample statistic gives us something pretty close to the population parameter. There's another type of statistics called descriptive statistics. And that's really when you uh, are only describing the data that you actually collected. In inferential statistics, you collect data from a sample and then you generalize those results to a population. In descriptive statistics, you don't do that generalization process. You simply describe the data that you collected. Some other important terms that we're going to deal with this semester are uh, independent variable and dependent variable. So I'm going to use uh, this example to illustrate these different terms. So again, I am interested in studying the population of college students. It's too large, I can't study them all, so I take a sample. And then I take that sample and I split it into two groups. Uh, in this study, I'm interested in seeing uh, the effect of the type of class people take on their overall satisfaction with that class after the semester is over. So my independent variable is the type of class. So if I randomly assign students to take a face-to-face -face class, half of them, and the other half of the sample would be randomly assigned to uh, an online class. I, my independent variable is type of class. It has two levels, either face-to-face -face class or online class. Again, that's the independent variable that has two levels. Then after people experience the class, we have uh, them take a questionnaire about how satisfied they are and that would be our dependent variable, course satisfaction. And so we get a, a mean satisfaction score for the face-to-face -face group, a mean satisfaction score for the uh, online group, and then we find the mean difference between those two. 
Which group had a higher mean? How far apart are they? That is the mean difference. That is called a sample statistic. It's, again, it's coming from the sample, the mean difference between these two groups. That sample statistic is supposed to represent a population parameter. That's supposed to give us a good estimate of what the population would be like if they took a face-to-face -face class versus an online class. If we took the entire population and split it in half and had half of them do a face-to-face -face and half do online, how different would they be in terms of satisfaction? Well, of course, we can't do that study. It's too big. So we use the sample, like we said, we get the sample statistic, the mean difference, and then we are hoping that that statistic that we get is going to be very close to the actual population parameter we get if we could do that study with the entire population. Some other key uh, concepts that you need to be aware with are the scale of measurement. Uh, when I talk about a scale of measurement, I'm really just talking about the per precision with which a, a variable is measured. Uh, we really think about scale of measurement as, really, there's four different scales of measurement. Uh, the, the lowest scale of measurement, the one with the least precision, is nominal. Uh, then you'll go up to ordinal, which is a little more precise. And then interval and ratio are more precise. And we really think about interval and ratio to, I mean, there are, they are different, but uh, within um, our class, we'll really be treating them as similar because the type of statistics you can use on interval and ratio variables are the same. Uh, and that leads into why this is an important concept to know. You'll be, you're going to need to know the scales of measurement for the entire class because it's going to determine uh, the types of statistics you can perform on different variables. So it will help you make those decisions if you're able to measure or if you're able to identify the, the correct scale of measurement. Now we're going to walk through uh, an example of how, or a few examples of how you can identify the different scales of measurement. Um, as I said in the previous slide, the scale of measurement helps you determine what type of statistic you can perform on that variable. Uh, a nominal scale of measurement is the least precise. The only thing it allows you to do is count the number of things within different categories. So for example, if I asked you, uh, a whole bunch of people, uh, what type of pet do you have? Uh, and then I would tally how many people said dog, how many people said cat, how many people said fish, how many people said hamster. Really, all I'm doing is putting people into a category and then counting the number of people in that category. Similarly, marital status uh, might have different categories. Someone could be married, they could be divorced, or they could be separated. Uh, or single, I suppose, never married. You could go on and on, but you have these different categories and uh, you're, you're simply putting someone in a category and then you are counting how many people in each category. So a nominal thing is just counting the number of things in a category. Very imprecise. Ordinal offers you a little more precision. It certainly counts, but it does more than that. It also allows you to rank variables. For example, if I measured annual income using the categories above average, average, and below average, I would again put people into different categories. Um, and I would know that someone who's in the above average category certainly made more money that year than somebody in the average category. So it allows me to rank people into these three different categories. But the problem with this one is I don't know how much more someone in the above average category makes than someone in the average category, right? It's just everybody who's above average is up there, and I don't know how much more any one individual made than any one other individual anywhere. 
So I can just say this person in the above is more made more than this person on average, but I don't know how much more. So it ranks but does not quantify. Probably the easy example of this uh, ordinal variable is just measuring speed in like a race. Uh, if somebody gets first, we know they're faster than the person who got third or second. We know they're faster, but we don't know how much faster. That race could have been incredibly close, or it could have been a, a, a runaway, so to speak. Uh, so it's um, the ordinal allows you to rank, but it does not allow you to quantify how much more one variable is than another. Now, interval is the next step up in precision. It and ratio allow you to count, rank, and quantify. So it allows you to identify how much more of something one value is than another value. So temperature in Fahrenheit is a good example of a interval scale of measurement. If it's 100 degrees out Fahrenheit, I know that that is two degrees hotter than 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Any two temperatures on the Fahrenheit scale, I can compute exactly how much hotter it was in Fahrenheit degrees. So it allows me to quantify how much more one score is than another score. Now this is considered an interval scale of measurement because zero degrees Fahrenheit is not the absence of heat. You can have negative numbers on the Fahrenheit scale. That's what makes this interval. Ratio is where a zero is the lowest score you can have. Uh, negative numbers can't happen on a ratio scale. And that's really the only difference between interval and ratio. And in terms of this class, again, we will be treating these two variables as similar because the types of statistics we can run on these two scales of measurement are the same. So we'll largely lump them together. Two other terms you should be familiar with is a discrete variable and a continuous variable. A discrete variable is simply a variable that can only be measured with whole numbers. So number of siblings someone has uh, you, you can't have half of a sibling. You either have one or you don't. So it doesn't make sense to think about uh, siblings in, as decimals or as fractions. So a discrete variable is something that can only happen um, in whole numbers. A continuous variable is something where a fraction or a decimal makes sense. So measuring someone's height, it's perfectly fine to think that somebody would be 68.2 inches possible or 68.2 inches tall um, if that is what makes this a continuous variable because a fraction is possible two other terms you should be familiar with are bar graphs and histograms uh, a bar graph is uh, simply a graph where the bars do not touch, and a histogram is one where they do. Uh, generally, you want to use a uh, bar graph on discrete variables and a histogram on continuous variables. Two other terms you should be familiar with. Um, I guess uh, I guess shapes you should be familiar with are shapes of distributions. Um, but I should tell you what a distribution is first. So. A distribution can come in many forms. It's basically, it's just a group of scores. Uh, you can have a, it can be just a list of numbers, or it can be in a table format, or it can be a graph. Here we have three graphs, and I'm going to want you to be familiar with these different shapes of graphs and uh, be able to recognize them. So this uh, first graph here uh, on the upper left is a, a normal curve. It's peaked in the center, 
uh, you can see that there are nine people. This is a frequency distribution curve. There are nine people who have a score of five. There are five people who have a score of three. There's only one person who has a score of zero. And um, we could go the other side too. And the, the thing that makes this normal is the highest point is in the middle of the curve. It's perfectly symmetrical. Um, and, and as you move away from the center, the frequency of scores as you move away gets less and less and less. This is a normal curve. We'll be dealing with those a lot this semester. The two curves on the bottom are a positively skewed distribution and a negatively skewed distribution. Um, you can see it's not symmetrical. The peak is not in the center. One of the tails is a lot longer than the other tail. Uh, when I say tail, you just go to the peak and then you sort of go down the slope to the left and right. And the longer tail has the, you know, the longer number line to the right if the positively skewed distribution. So, um, Again, I, I would one easy way, I think, to remember the difference or to how to tell the difference between a positively skewed and negatively skewed distribution would be to uh, look at which one has the longer tail. In a positively skewed distribution, the longer tail is pointing to the, to the right or the more positive numbers. And uh, the negative distribution, it's the longer tail is pointing to the left, or it's pointing to where the negative numbers would be. Uh, some other shapes you should be familiar with are platypertic, which is the curve is a little flatter than normal, and leptopertic, which means it leaps up in the middle it's, uh, relative to a normal curve. Now, the last thing that I'll go over is the uh, frequency table and how to read it. Here you have um, the X column, which indicates uh, the type of response that's possible. It's, this, it's a score. So I might have asked somebody, do you agree with this statement? And they would indicate the degree to which they agree by uh, giving me a response of one, which says they strongly agree, all the way up to five, which means they strongly disagree. And so the X's are the type of response they could give, right? Then you have F, which is the frequency. In this table, you can see that there were two people who gave a response of one. There were seven people who gave a response of three and so on. And now um, we have the percent column and the percentile column. So the percent column is the percentage of scores that are at a given value. So there are two ones, as I said, and I believe, let's see, we are 10, I'm counting up, I think we have 23 people in this distribution. So if you take um, two divided by 23, you're gonna get 8.7. Uh, if you take um, four, which is the frequency for uh, a, a score of two, four divided by 23 is gonna give you 17.39. So that's how those percentages are computed. The percentile is the percentage of scores that are at or below the given value. So if we look at the lowest score possible, the percentile and the percentage are the same because it's the lowest score. But if we go up to the second highest score, the way you're gonna get that 26.9 is you're gonna take two plus four because those are the two lowest scores. And you're gonna add those together to get six and then divide that by the total frequency. And that will give you 26. To get the 56.25, it would be two plus four plus seven divided by the total number of responses, or in other words, the total number of Fs. Uh, I think those are the skills and the knowledge you'll need to know to uh, do the first activity fairly well. Again, there's more details in the chapter that are worth reviewing. If you have any questions, as always, 
you're welcome to give me a call.